I do have a word for you, and the word is unconventional. Say unconventional. I want to teach a little bit. I say I'm going to teach. Now I got that word from prophetess. We don't know what we're going to do, huh? <laughs> the word is unconventional. And I believe what the Lord is saying uh, to this 8 a.m. service is that he wants to set your mind to identify and be ready for his unconventional movements through the rest of this year. God is going to do something for you 8 a.m. that's going to be unexpected, a little odd, a little different. It will be unconventional. So a part of my assignment this morning is to give you red car syndrome. Do you know what that is? There's a, there's a different scientific name for it, but really what red car syndrome is, it's like when you buy a red car, suddenly you realize that everybody else has bought a red car. But the truth of the matter is those red cars were already there. Say already there. You just didn't see them until you got one. And so there are ways and means and opportunities and strategies and connections and open doors for you that are what? Already there. Come on, there are ways and means, opportunities, connections. There is wealth, riches. There's genius, 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 the mind of God and activation through the man and woman of God. There's genius for you that is already there. But what God wants to do is cause you to look for and recognize things that he's doing that may seem unconventional. Say unconventional. Unconventional. I want to give you three scriptures that you're going to pray over yourself this week. Okay? You know, you know the coach always wants to give assignments. Like, he, you know, when the big sister is in charge, the younger kids want to say, you're not the mama. <laughs> Philippians 2.13 in the Amplified Bible it says for it is not your strength but it is God who, uh, who is effectively at work in you both to will, say willing and to work, say working so it says it is God who is effectively at work in you both to will and to work that is strengthening, energizing, creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. Now, you know, the Amplified is very wordy, but basically what it's saying is it's God that makes you want it and it's God that's going to give you the power to get it. Okay, that's just a short version of Philippians 2.13. That's the PR version. God, you are working in me, adjusting my desires. One of the things me and Apostle BJ pray over ourselves is, God, help me to want what you want me to want. Okay, don't we? <laughs> we say, help, us to, help me to want what you want me to want. So God is going to change what I want. And then he's going to get the power, give me the power to go get the things that he wants me to want. Got it? All right, here's the second one you're going to pray. So the first thing we're going to pray this week, God, help me to want what you want me to want. Lord, give me both the desire and the power to do the things that fulfill my destiny and to make you happy. Don't we want to just give God joy? Don't we want to just make him happy? He already sings over us songs of deliverance. He's going to sing songs over you of joy and happiness and affirmation because you're going to receive the correction of your desires today. All right, Psalm 37 and 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Am I going too fast? You getting these scriptures? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and the petitions of your heart. God wants to give you your heart's desire only after you delight in him. When you make the Lord your delight, another word for delight is delicacy. We all have our favorite desserts. Don't tell Apostle K. Mine is tiramisu. Now you can't eat it every day. But it's like cake drenched in coffee covered in cream with cocoa on top? It's my delight. Come on. Well, what would happen if I loved the Lord more than that dessert? He becomes my delight. He becomes my craving. He becomes the thing that my mouth wants. My body wants to be in the presence of the Lord. My mind wants to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm going to delight myself so much in him. And before I realize it, I'm changing. My heart is changing. My eyes are changing. My appetites are changing. And that's when he then gives me the desires of my heart. Why? Because now he knows what's in my heart. 
right? So we're going to pray that over ourselves this week. Father, as I delight in you, cause me to love you more than I love hot Cheetos. Cause me to love you more than I love my favorite dessert. I want to love you like that. The stuff we stand in line to get. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you stand in line, the stuff we stand in line to get, right? Cause me to love you like that, Father. And here's our third scripture, Matthew 22, 36. 22, 36. These are the, the legalists. They were asking Jesus, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Say heart. With all your soul. Say soul. And with all your mind. Mind. An element of your soul is indeed your desire, what you want. God, help me to love you with my desires. Your will is a part of your soul. How do we love the Lord with your whole soul? How do you love the Lord with your whole mind? I love to give the Lord my mind. And ask, because he's constantly, so much of my training in the Holy Ghost is what are you thinking? Why are you thinking that? Why are you upset? Why are you aggravated? Why is you, don't let your mind go there. Put a leash on that. Pull that thing back into alignment. Cast down every imagination that exalts itself against what you already know about me. Now, he said you don't know everything about me, but there's a few things you know that should regulate your mind. You know God is healer, so you're not even thinking about what will happen if I get sick. He'll heal me. That's what's going to happen. You know he's a provider, so you're never thinking, what if I go bankrupt? That's not going to happen because I, I participate in seed time and harvest. Amen? So the, we're going to pray these three scriptures over ourselves this week. Now, let me get to my message, and I can drive it fast in 19 minutes and 8 seconds. You ready? All right. I want to talk to you about this beautiful story of the anointing of Jesus at Bethany because it was unconventional. Say unconventional. It was unconventional. Matthew 26, starting at verse 6. I will read it to you, and I'm see if the guys can get it up for us. Matthew 26, starting at verse 6. Now when Jesus was back in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, remember that, and a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' head and he, as he reclined at the table. But when the disciples, uh, yeah, not the world, when the disciples saw this, <laughs> they were indignant and angry. And this is what they were saying. Why all this waste of money? Like, I, don't, I don't understand why, why they're doing this. When, you, when you're unconventional, people are not going to understand why you're doing what you're doing. When God comes to you and leads you in an unconventional way, not everybody will understand. So, of course, they're going to have some opinions, and they express those uh, opinions out loud. Jesus, aware of the malice of this remark. See, Jesus knows what we say, but he also knows why we say it. You know, it wasn't that they were saying, my God, this lady needs her money. Why is she doing this? She shouldn't waste this. They weren't saying it out of concern. Sometimes we say things and we tell ourselves we're saying it out of concern, but the Lord knows the reason why. He judges the motives of your heart. You know, the, the further you go in God, first he's going to deal with the things you do in your flesh. Stop drinking, stop smoking, stop fornicating. Those are childish things. Come on, those are like still riding a big wheel. You're 45 years old. Quit doing that right? Then eventually as you grow into sonship, now he's going to begin to deal with why you do the things you do and why you say you do it. You say you're saying it for this reason, but really it wasn't about the waste of money. There was malice. There was judgment. He knows why we're critiquing. And so he dealt, he knew the, he knew it and he didn't even really, uh, uh, um, rebuked them harshly, he, did, he gave them an explanation. Isn't that wonderful of the Lord? He, when, you, when, you're, when your motives are not right, you need revelation. He said, no, you're, not, you're doing the right thing, but not for the right reasons. Let me give you real revelation. And so this is what Jesus said. He says, knowing the malice of this remark, he said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a good thing to me. Who did she do it to? Jesus. The things you do, you do for the Lord. 
He said, she's done a good thing to me, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I assure you, and most solemnly I say to you, wherever this gospel of salvation is preached in the whole world, say whole world, we do not serve an American God, right? I keep telling myself, we do not serve an American God. We do not serve an American God. That's why the Lord said, don't be afraid of a no. You have a global calling. So if one person says no, you're like, okay, one down, 400 billion people to go. <laughs> Somewhere there's an audience for what you got. <laughs> yes, get on a plane and find them, huh? So he said, she, well, the whole world that this woman has done will also be told the memory of her for her act of love and devotion. Wherever the gospel of salvation is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her for her act of love and devotion. It's a beautiful story. In, in Matthew and Mark, it talks about anointing the head. In John, it says anointed the feet. But I'll tell you this, we do know some things. If you're ready to write, I'm gonna tell you the things that we know about what this woman did. Number one, she did the unexpected. If you go to someone's house for dinner, if I were to ask you to come to my house for dinner, first of all, you'd say, Indiana, right? <laughs> Indiana, <laughs> if I ask you to come to my house for dinner, you have some idea of what's going to happen there. You'll probably ring the bell or knock on the bell. I'll let you in. You're going to get a big hug. You'll meet my mom, my kids. You probably expect you're going to sit at a table. You probably expect you're going to have some good food with me. My mom's from Arkansas. There will be greens. <laughs> I tell people I was raised in San Diego, Arkansas. I grew up on the West Coast, but outside of my house was San Diego. Inside of my house was Arkansas. So, so you, you have an idea of what you're going to expect. But the last thing you expect is somebody's going to come and pour perfume oil on your head while I'm sitting eating some food. She did the unexpected. God is going to prompt you to do the unexpected before the end of 2018. You're going to have to do what seems inappropriate but is really unexpected. Now, I'm not giving you permission to be rebellious. Remember, he knows the motives. That's why it's so important that we allow the Lord to judge our heart and that we respond immediately when he checks us. Why did you say that? Why did you do that? Why is this important to you? God says these people are going to do the unexpected. And how do you know you do the unexpected? When folks around you don't expect you to do it. People will keep you where they meet you. Well, when I met you, you were this. And it makes me a little uncomfortable when you become that because you fit in my world. See, we are all the center of our own world. If you really don't let God be the center, you will become the star of your own world. 54, have mercy, right? <laughs> We're all the center of our own world, and so everybody else around us fits into our world. And so if you fit very nicely and neatly into my world, I know who you are. I've categorized you. I've decided who you are and what you can do. I've decided who you're not and what you cannot do. And then sometimes I see you doing something, and it's not that I've never seen it before. I just never see you do it. Well, nobody expected you to get married. Well, nobody expected you to start a business. Well, nobody expected you to say no to this. You always get two fingers when I'm pouring it out. What do you mean no? God is going to prompt you to do the unexpected. The second thing she did, come on, say, God, God help, me help me do, do what, is what is not expected in a good way. In a good way. Beyond your fears beyond your limitations, beyond your self-imposed restraints. Come on, you don't have to meet anybody's expectation of you but the Lord. It is he that made you, he formed you, it's his breath in you. Don't be afraid of other people's reactions when you decide, I've gotta do something that nobody is expecting me to do. I gotta break out of this. I gotta break out of this. You good? The second thing she did was, the whole title of our message, she did the un- conventional. Unexpected doesn't mean it's never been done. It just means nobody expected you to do it. But unconventional is something that no one's done. It's innovative. It's kind of avant-garde. It's rather cutting edge. You attend a church that does the unconventional. 
the unconventional, kind of breaking with traditions. She, first of all, if the men are having dinner at the table, woman, you're not even in the room. First of all, <laughs> you're not even in the room. Let alone are you approaching the guest of honor. Let alone are you breaking open this box and pouring this thing on this man's head. It's horribly, un it's, it's just out of order, ma'am, right? But her motive, say motive. That's why you got to balance this out with knowing the content of your heart. Knowing the content of your heart. God, I'm going to do something that is unconventional, innovative. I'm a firm believer that Christians should be the most creative, innovative, inspiring, cutting-edge people on the planet. Why? The creator of all things created lives on the inside of you. When I meet with my team and I say, do you have any ideas? And they say, I don't have any ideas. I say, do you have the Holy Ghost? Because the Holy Ghost is the idea factory. He's the idea factory. He has the genius. We have, we have access to the genius of God to tap into and activate our dormant genius on the inside of us. If you can't think of something new, you need to pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you. If you only do what has already been done, you, need to, you are missing out on a major part of your relationship with God. If you are the person at work who just nods and you never speak up and you never come up with a fresh idea, you are missing out on a huge part of your relationship with God. That is one of the keys to believers becoming the head and not the tail. Why? Because we're the innovators. We're the ones saying, you know what we can do? You know what I've thought about? I'm going to meditate on this. I bet God can do something. That's what made Daniel stand out. He said, let me go pray and ask. But let me go pray and God is going to tell me what to do. Why? Because I'm innovative. I'm going to do the unconventional. The unconventional. Jesus was unconventional. John the Baptist was unconventional. I mean, talk about an avant-garde diet. <laughs> Locusts and honey. Well, that's new. Talk about an avant-garde a wardrobe, huh? Camel hair. Well, that's different. One of the reasons why we don't want to be different is because we don't want to be noticed. I'm going to just blend in, stay back here in the cut, and don't just, please, God, don't let nobody see me, Father. Just don't let nobody. Because if they notice me, they may expect something out of me. And what if I have one good idea, and then they come back tomorrow and want another? Oh, my God. Have you ever accidentally cooked something that turned out really good? And you say, I hope they don't want no more of this ever. <laughs> but if you, let me tell you something. One great thing is a great, you have a great meal. But if you can keep the recipe, you can have a chain of restaurants. <laughs> Honey, listen. It's the genius of God. Ideas are the highest currency on the planet. And when God gives you, a, when you ask God for wealth, he will often give you a strategy. He will often give you an idea. You ask God for a way out, he will give you a map. We expect to be translated out of trouble and into peace. And he will give you a way out. He said, I will be the way. You with me? All right. Jesus was unconventional. He had women on his team, first of all. Allowed women to follow him. Talked to the woman at the well. Touched a leper. I mean, touched dead people. Come on, he did everything but eat a pork chop sandwich. He was unconventional. <laughs> you do enough things unconventional, and what's going to happen is, here's the, here's the third thing about this woman, the results affected everyone around her. You can only hide what God is doing in you for a certain amount of time. She poured out that ointment, and it said the smell filled the room. It's a time is out for secret success. The reason why we want secret success is because we don't want the tribulation that comes with it. it honey, fries come with that. <laughs> what do you say? I'll give you wealth with persecution. Well, I want the wealth, but I don't want the persecution. Honey, fries come with that. <laughs> you don't have to eat them, but it's going to be fries right next to them ribs. <laughs> you want the success? You're going to get some haters to go with it. Fries come with that. It affects everybody. Everybody could see your success. Everybody could do it. Why? God doesn't get the glory out of your secret success. You can secretly give, but your harvest is going to be public. Come on, you can secretly sow, but that harvest is going to be public. 
Mm -hmm. I've gotten so many words about, about marriage. Come on. Send all your inquiries to Matthew Stevenson Worldwide. It's the first line of defense is a good daddy, huh? <laughs> and what I thought was, oh no, I'm going to have a small little secret something, and then I'll release a little Facebook video and say, hello everybody, I just want to introduce you to, you know, King Ahmed Abare from a... Uh... He found me! <laughs> that was my plan! A little tiny, small little thing, won't nobody know. It'd be me, Apostle, Apostle B, and maybe Veronica. We're just going to do this, put on a rock, and just show up at work on Monday. <laughs> and the Lord said, I would get no glory from that. Now, do you want, my, you want your comfort or do you want his glory? Do you want your comfort or do you want his glory? I said, do you want your comfort or do you want God's glory? Come on, come on. <laughs> Can you, nope, that, that is no longer my plan. God, do whatever you want to do. Here's the next thing. People had something to say. When you decide to defy the expectation, when you decide to do something unconventional, people are going to have something to say, good or bad. Do not let social media make your day, and do not let social media break your day. If you have a really good day because you got a lot of likes, you need to uh, schedule counseling. Yeah, I had a really great day. Everybody's liking my selfie. You need counseling. Because you are teeter-tottering on people making or breaking your day. Your life is built on sand. Trust me, trust me. If the opinions of people make or break. Now, I love affirmation. We're in a series called Affirmation. But if the opinions of random strangers who say they know you and really don't know you, who say they love you, don't know your birthday and Facebook, don't pop it up on the screen. If they can make or break your day, your life is built on sand, baby. You better anchor that thing in the Lord. People are always going to have something to say. And the fear of man is a snare. This, this, let me give you this scripture. It has kept my sanity. Proverbs 29 and 25 has kept my sanity. The Lord said the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. It'll trap you. You ever seen it? I actually looked up. I Googled snare. Don't do it. The images are horrific. An animal walking along steps in a snare and a wire catches it by the limb. Some animals have lost their limbs, some have lost their lives, but the whole point is it immobilizes you so you are stuck and you become the prey. The fear of man. This is the Bible teaching us this so we can survive and live in a world where we love people, but we are not governed by the opinions of people. So he says, if you are more afraid of them than you are of me, it's going to stop you. You'll be on your way to me and go. And do not get to the end of your life and say, God, I would have done it. Lord, you know, I really would have started that orphanage. God, I really would have done it, but nobody was with me. The Lord said, you never even told anybody you were doing it. You never even stepped out to do it. The fear of man is a snare. People will always have something to say. Love people, but do not be governed by their opinions. Here's, the, uh, here's my uh, two more points, and I got two and a half minutes. Here we go. Jesus affirmed her actions and her motives. Let God speak on your behalf. Let God speak on your behalf. Let me tell you. One of the greatest pains, I don't know if it's just me because I'm a people person, can you tell? Very obvious I'm an extrovert. Very obvious I'm a love machine. I mean, I just love folks. I meet you and love you. Don't, I ain't gonna give you my car keys, but I do love you. <laughs> I just love at first sight. I just love God's people. I believe every person has a bit of God's glory in them. And as a developer, I'm just instantly curious into what was in God's mind when he made you, right? And so one of the things we have to recognize, for me, one of my greatest pains is being misunderstood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when you do something for one reason and then people say, well, she just did that because, and it's so tempting. I mean, the temptation is so great to turn towards the person and give a full dissertation. And, you know, you're on your way to do what God called you to do. And then somebody says, well, what does she think? That she just think. And then, you just, oh, can I, sis? No, really, uh, uh, 10 years ago, 
When I was on a fast, the Lord told me, you give a whole dissertation as to why you're doing what you're doing for God. Here's the truth of the matter. They don't really want to know. <laughs> if you're on your way to do what God called you to do and someone does not understand it, this woman did not stop pouring the oil to say, oh, no, 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 no. This is why I'm doing it. I've been forgiven of a whole lot of sin. And this is she didn't stop. Her eyes were on him. Jesus was her justifier. Jesus is your vindicator. Come on, Jesus is your advocate. Come on, Jesus will speak for you. If you want to catch me, catch me in the spirit. If you want to understand me, ask my maker. I don't even understand me. I can't give you a full understanding of me. I'm still figuring out how to be Pam Ross. Come on, you're still figuring you out. You better ask the Lord. Listen to this. Look at what the Apostle Paul said. I love, this is the Apostle Paul. I'm fearless, shipwrecked, bit by a snake, beaten, stoned. <laughs> this is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, if I had, oh man, where's my scripture? I'm going to just tell it to you because I, I don't want to waste my time. He said, listen, if I had been still wanting to make people happy and please people, I would not be a Christ follower. He said, I wouldn't even be saved. Now think about it. Sitting in this seat, how many of you got saved here? Okay. How many of you got saved in a church? Okay, I got saved in the parking lot of a restaurant. <laughs> I love street ministry. But if you're sitting in a seat and the, and the man of God, woman of God is giving an altar call and, you, and you've, you know God is calling you to give your life to him, the first thing, the number one thing that's battling you is what will people think? I would get up and give my life to the Lord, but who's going to have an opinion? Who cares? I mean, that's just the all nations mantra. We don't care about that. We reassure people constantly. We don't care about that. That's why we applaud thunderously when someone has the courage to say, this is what I need. This is the house I'm supposed to be at. This is what I need. Jesus uh, affirmed her actions and her motives. He said, this woman has done a good thing to me. This is between her and me. When you do your work unto the Lord, the Lord will affirm your work. You good? All right, here's the, here's the last one. The last one with this unconventional move. God is affirming your unconventional moves. You will never be forgotten. The Bible says the memory of the righteous is blessed. You will not build a legacy without doing something unconventional. The normal live and the normal die every day. But it's only those that are willing to step out of normalcy and do something radical for God. It's all, those are the ones that are going to be remembered. Listen, I had this amazing, I mean, just a, a amazing time this weekend with these women of God. And one of the things I learned from every single one of them all of them had to pass through what I call that firewall of fear. Where, you, you know, you're, you're kind of you're going along and you're following God and you're doing what he says do. And there's always a level that your flesh has to pass through that will burn off another layer of man-pleasing. That will burn off another layer of uh, family and, and maybe unrighteous soul ties. There's always another level that you have to pass through. Are you going to really make an unconventional and bold move for God? He affirmed her. She came into a place that apparently she really wasn't welcomed. She did something no one expected. Her act was outrageously unconventional. It affected everybody around her and people had something to say but Jesus affirmed her and she will never be forgotten can you stand up let's pray I'm done hallelujah hallelujah I feel like God wants to, the reason why he wanted to give you red car syndrome is because many times what I call dreaming, how I define dreaming, is employing your imagination into the will of God. Employing your imagination into the agenda of God. That's what I call dreaming. Some of us have lazy imaginations 
because we don't put our mind to thinking about what I could do for God and what I would do for God if I really partnered with him. When you put your mind in that place and you meditate long enough on it, God is gonna give you both the desire and the ability to do the things that please him. And what pleases him is this, when you become the man or woman he had in mind when he made you. I call it restoring people to God's original idea. God had an idea of you and he has a dream for you. All right, come on, lift your hands. Father, we thank you for today. And I thank you that you're causing us not to walk by opportunities, connections, advancement. I thank you, Lord God, that ways and means that you're making, uh, uh, even those pathways through the Red Sea. I thank you, Lord God, that we're not gonna, uh, we're, we're going to consider things that we otherwise would not consider because we recognize that we serve a God who's unconventional. Lord, our hearts are open. We're opening up even the closed mind and we're breaking through the traditional ways of thinking. We're breaking out of limitations that come to us because of our gender, because of our ethnicity, because of our social status, because of our economic bracket. We, Lord God, we thank you that we partner with you and you are unlimited. Your genius is unlimited. Your resources are unlimited. Your money is unlimited. Your wisdom is unlimited. And we say yes, yes. We say yes ah, to even doing the unconventional. We say yes to fresh ideas and innovation. Lord, breathe on us. Breathe on our plans, breathe on us at work, breathe on those of us that are struggling even in the area of parenting, trying to understand our children, wanting them to have more than what we have. Lord, breathe on us and let us not disqualify what you give us because we compare it to what you've given somebody else. We break the snare of comparison in Jesus' name. We break it now. We break it. We break it. It's a false security. It's a false comfort. The Holy Ghost is my comforter. Come on. The Holy Ghost is my comfort. I don't take comfort in being small. I take comfort in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You can be seated.